Ladies and gentle people, welcome back to another episode of the Nerd By Word podcast. We have a very special episode for you this week where we channel our inner teachers and assigned each other some homework. But first, before we start discussing our homework, uh, I am That Nerd Dave here with That Nerd Chris, and we are going to hit the nerd news. Chris, what is your nerd news story for the week? Uh, I wish I had good news, but... Uh... DC Comics and Warner Brothers at large experienced a large number of layoffs. As many as 600 individuals were laid off at Warner Brothers, including several senior editorial staff at DC Comics, like Editor-in-Chief Bob Harris, um, SVP of Publishing Strategy and Support Services Hank Canals, uh, VP Bobby Chase, and Editors Brian Cunningham, Mark Doyle, and Andy Curry. Uh, the latter two were key to the Black Label initiative that seemed to be making so money, so that was a bit of a shock. Um, the interim replacements for Harris as editors-in-chief are Marie Javins, who has previous experience in digital strategy, um, and Michelle Wells, who is head of their uh, young adult section. Um, in addition to this, they canceled a lot of comic books, including some that seemed to be selling and, and you know, selling pretty well and that were well received by fans um batgirl batman and the outsiders justice league odyssey those were announced to be ending in october and then they uh scheduled more to get the axe in november um teen titans young justice suicide squad hawkman john constantine hellblazer um and also it does not look good for the aquaman title which is really shocking um Batman's Grave and Metal Men uh, limited series is also reaching its planned end in November. Now, I looked at a Jim Lee interview, who's the publisher, and nerds will know him from, you know, being the art superstar that he was in the 90s and continues to be to this day. But he's the publisher and the big name of note um, at DC. Uh, he had an interview with The Hollywood Reporter, and he confirmed that all original content from the DC Universe app is moving to HBO Max. Um, and that's been kind of a trend that we've been monitoring over the past few weeks and months. Um, and that DC is still focused on comics uh, and that they're just consolidating them, taking the bottom to 20 to 25% of, of the poorer selling books, um, which doesn't seem really consistent because some of the ones that were canceled seem to be doing pretty well. But um, he also like tried to squash a lot of rumors that AT&T who purchased Warner brothers and Warner media back in 2018 um, was trying to get out of the comic book business that they didn't see a future in it. He squashed those rumors and said that, you know, DC is still primarily like an idea factory for, you know, the future um, and other forms of media. Um, the timing of all this is wild when you consider that the ink is still drying on the Divorce with Diamond distribution and that DC's fandom that they have been hyping up like nobody's business on social media and the internet at large is literally days away. Like, as of this recording, we're recording on the 21st of August. I believe it's tomorrow is, is you know, fandom. So this is just really wild. Dave, you're our resident DC guy. What is this? Uh, how's this landing with you? Well, I have a, this vein uh, on the side of my head that seems to be pulsating and sticking out every time I talk about DC Comics right now. I'm just really concerned about this. DC Universe is dying. Uh, DC Direct, which made collectibles, is a gone or two. It, this definitely smells of the corporate overlords at AT&T doing their best to sort of pinch their pennies. Uh, and that's really, really troubling to me. What worried me the most about this, less so than, you know, the DC Universe thing, which I think the writing has been on the wall, 
Um, Bleeding Cool, which is generally really good uh, when it comes to sources for some you know behind the scenes reporting. Uh, when they reported on the layoffs, uh, said, and I quote, the layoffs will have an immediate effect on the publication of DC Comics monthly titles, including a rapid reduction of titles. The idea that, you know, Aquaman and Suicide Squad are coming to an end, and then Brian Michael Bendis' Young Justice series is also coming to an end. And and Young Justice has been a really good book, but it's a Brian Michael Bendis book. When he jumped ship to DC, he was basically the golden boy. He got Superman. He could do no wrong. And now they took one of his uh, titles, one of his pet projects, basically, and axed it as well. So I'm really concerned about this. I think it's just a bad move on the part of AT&T. I think it's a bad move on the part of Warner Brothers in a lot of ways. Look, Disney has this figured out with Marvel Comics. At Marvel, they keep the wheels going. Uh, They put out as much content as possible in an effort to fuel future movie adaptations. So say what you will about Marvel's output. They're constantly trying new things and hit the market with a lot of books and a lot of ideas. Reducing DC Comics output in the short term might save a few nickels and dimes, but it also deprives Warner of potential source material for billion-dollar blockbuster movies. I also need to point out that the reason Marvel has been so successful is that the studio part of Marvel attempts to be fairly true to the source material, the comic books. The reason much of Warner Brothers' output has failed is its lack of faith in the comics division, in the source material. So in short, uh, Warner, AT&T, you want huge billion dollar comic book movies? You have to put some faith into the comic book publishing arm of your company. And this is not that. Yeah, I'm going to, I know Dave, you know, being a German born citizen, you're you're not big on on American sports per se, but I'm going to use like a a baseball reference here. I think of Marvel in, in DC right now, I'm getting mad New York Yankees and New York Mets vibes. And the New York Yankees have this storied history and building through the farm system and going through the minor leagues and building their talent for the future. And then that pays off with success in the World Series. Um, And then you have like the New York Mets who are just chasing the success of, you know, the other team in town and, and everything. So like I think of that with like you have the MCU and you have this interconnected universe that took its time. Um, and you have Iron Man in 2008, and then you don't have a team-up movie with all of those heroes for four years. You don't have that until 2000, 2012. And then you have all of this building towards Endgame that took 10 or 11 years to tell this story. And then you have, like, the DCEU who is just like, oh, we could do that too. And then, like, right away, you want that? We got Justice League, and here's Darkseid, and here's Superman's dead already, and here's Superman versus Batman just, like, right in the second movie. In the first movie, they meet up, and... It's, it's such spastic, and it seems like they're just chasing after this instead of taking the necessary time to build something. Um, they're just trying to cut to the end result and, like, take this shortcut, and it's not working. Um, all of the news that you've seen in the headlines with DC over the past couple of months is not positive. Now, I'm I'm one of the ones, and we've we've explored the diamond distribution monopoly, you know, at nauseum on this podcast. So I am of one who felt like the move away from the monopoly that diamond distribution had was one that needed to be made. But when you add that to things like layoffs, um releasing the DC Universe app just within like the last, what, two years only to kowtow it to HBO Max. Um, And then, you know, like these layoffs. I'm not a person that believes that any publicity is good publicity. Over the past several months, everything that you see in the news about DC, very little of it is positive. Um, You have the Snyder Cut, which, you know, for those fans, you know, that's something to rally around. But a lot of other stuff for DC content is not promising. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And, you know, we, we uh, talked about this a little bit on social media, but it seems like the idea right now is very much a corporate idea that's behind DC, and that is t- take no risks and double down on the stuff that's made money in the past. And we talked about this uh, just yesterday uh, when we heard that uh, Ben Affleck is potentially coming back uh, to play Batman again in a in a potential Flash movie, which at this point would mean that we would have two Batmen in a Flash movie. 
And I don't quite understand that from a creative standpoint, why you would want to have a Flash movie that doesn't actually seem to focus on the Flash. And what it comes down to is it's the same kind of motivation. Batman in the past has sold tickets to movies, so let's just go ahead and put him in everything. Uh, And if we can, let's introduce a multiverse so we can have more than one at the same time. It's a very narrow perspective on the creative process. And that's really what we're talking about here. DC Comics is is a creative powerhouse that is basically getting its wings clipped right now. And I find that incredibly regrettable. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you think of of things like Disney Plus and, you know, they're rolling out Star Wars and, you know, Marvel content. You know, it's it's this very planned and methodical approach. You know, you have the Mandalorian with one episode per week, and it's this drawn out, planned out phase. And then you have like the DC Universe launch, and within two years, it's dried up. It's just really a regrettable thing, and and just doesn't seem like it was, you know, whether it's you know, poor planning or just listening to the corporate overlords. And I, I really think that that's poor planning and, and narrow mindedness on their part, you know, to echo your sentiments because Disney is a larger corporation than AT&T and they get it. They understand what gems that they hold with, with the star Wars, um, you know, name with, you know, Marvel with, you know, even some of the smaller ones, they have like um, national geographic and stuff on, on there as well. And, you know, and they mine that for for content, and you know they've done pretty well for themselves. So I, I just don't understand it, even from the corporate you know perspective. But um, yeah, now Dave, you're headed in a direction that I must admit, in my fandom, I'm extremely a novice in. What you got for us? Well, I wanted to just have some positive news for a change because there's been so much negative news lately. This DC Comics thing has just really made me sad. But then there was some good news. Christopher Eccleston is returning to Doctor Who. Now, Doctor Who, of course, is the long-running British science fiction show that uh, follows the alien Doctor in his travels through time and space. The show was cancelled in the 1980s before being revived in 2005 with Eccleston in the title role. But he left the show after only one season. And fans have wondered for quite a while what in the world happened there. Now, much later, only a couple of years ago, I believe, Uh, Eccleston actually revealed that his relationship with the showrunner deteriorated during filming. Um, He said, and I quote, It, the relationship, broke down irreparably during the first block of filming, and it never recovered. They lost trust in me, and I lost faith and trust and belief in them. So Eccleston has been staying far away from Doctor Who, blaming his decision to leave the show for even being blacklisted by the British film and television industry. Uh, He even famously decided to not appear in the show's 50th anniversary special, even though he was offered a role in that. So now, this news that Eccleston is returning to Doctor Who is huge. Now, he is not returning to the television series, but instead to audio uh, productions from the company Big Finish, who has been uh, doing audio productions of Doctor Who and various other properties for many years. Uh, And his run of audio adventures is set to be released in May of 2021. Now, Eccleston's take on The Doctor was a lot of fun to me. As a fan of the show, he was my first incarnation of The Doctor, as I'd never actually been exposed to the show before him. It went off the air when I was extremely young. So Eccleston's performance is actually what hooked me and made me a fan of Doctor Who ever since. I know some fans might be disappointed that he's not returning to the show for some kind of crossover episode with other incarnations of the Doctor or anything like that. And at first, that might still happen if this project is a positive experience for him. And second, Big Finish creates fantastic audio stories. In fact, I'll be talking a little bit about that uh, later this episode. So I'm just really, really pumped that Eccleston is returning to Doctor Who. Chris, what do you think about this? No, I must admit, as I as I said, like I know next to nothing about Doctor Who. The one thing that I absolutely know is that their alumni includes some of the top actors in the business. You look at individuals like Karen Gillan from Nebula and uh, the Jumanji films, um, David Bradley uh, in the Harry Potter films, 
um, and uh, he was Walter Frey in Game of Thrones, John Hurt, who's been in literally everything, um, David Tennant, who's a master actor, uh, Matt Smith, and my personal favorite, I hold a soft spot in my heart for Peter Capaldi. Um, one of my favorite shows is The Musketeers. It's like any, anything that Alexander Dumas ever wrote. I've said this on the pod before. Anything that Dumas wrote is gold in my heart. And he did a fantastic Cardinal Richelieu for the BBC show, The Musketeers. And so I was super bummed when he um, left The Musketeers. But then when I saw why, I was like, I get it. He's going to be the doctor. So, um, but yeah, I, so this this is like a project for me. Whenever my schedule clears, maybe over this summer, I'm going to have to do a deep dive because seeing all of these A-list names in one place, it's something I have to check out. We'll definitely have to have a long conversation about that because uh, it is a hotly debated topic among Doctor Who fans what the perfect entry point is to that series. Basically, which Doctor should be your first? I have my own thoughts on that, and maybe that's something we can explore uh, in a future episode. So that is it for Nerd News. Uh, After our break, we are going to be quizzing each other on our homework assignments. Stick around. All right, folks, welcome back to the Nerd Byword podcast. So this episode, we are going to focus on something a little bit different with our Nerd Big Talk. Um... I am a DC guy, and Chris, of course, is a Marvel guy. So in this episode, we decided that we each give the other a homework assignment, a run from our favorite comic book company that we particularly appreciate. And we wanted to try to maybe convert each other a little bit to the other side of the fence, and at the same time, just really explore some good comic book stories. My homework assignment for Chris was... Batgirl, Volume 3, written by Brian Q. Miller and drawn by a variety of artists. The series ran from 2009 to 2011 and was ultimately cancelled after 24 issues uh, due to the new 52 reboot at DC Comics. We had the wonderful pleasure of interviewing writer Brian Q. Miller for a uh, past episode. I highly recommend you check that out, but... In the meantime, let's go ahead and figure out what Chris's take was on his homework assignment. So Chris, first of all, what did you like most about what you read in Batgirl Stephanie Brown Brown by Brian Q. Miller? I love how eternally hopeful she is. Um, The immediate thing after the very first issue I texted you, I was like, this is Ultimate Spider-Man. Like, this is exactly what Ultimate Spider-Man is. She really just wants to do good in the world. Um, and she really just wants justice to be served. And like, even though so many people in her life are like, Stephanie, stop it. Stephanie, stop doing this. No, Stephanie, you cannot do this. She knows in her heart of hearts that the right thing to do is for her to put on the cape and cowl and to go and fight crime in Gotham. And I just love everything about that. Like, um, and I, I just cannot get away from the Peter Parker vibes of, you know, being in in school and missing out on assignments or oversleeping and it's it's just undeniable the parallels um but the thing that i really enjoyed as well um was her part of the reason she wants to do all of this is because she wants to correct the sins of the father and this is an ever present theme that i've found in literature at large is the sins of the father um you know it's biblical even um if you want to go that route um her father's a super villain and she just feels that much more conviction to do the right thing because of who her father was Yeah, I totally agree with that. The optimism of the book is really what ultimately drew me in. And I did mention this in a previous pod, at at that point, DC Comics was going through kind of a dark phase. Everything was kind of grimdark there for a couple of years. And so Stephanie Brown was that book that stuck out uh, on the shelves to me and really attracted me because it was the one DC book, uh, there were a couple of others, but the one DC book that really stood out as as positive, uh, inspiring. And, and those are things I always look for in my comic books. Uh, one of the reasons I love Superman so much. Now, Chris, what do you think could have been better in this book? 
The one thing that really never quite vibed with me was the Wendy Harris or proxy storyline. It seemed a little bit forced to me. It seemed um, a little convenient that she had so much in common with with Barbara Gordon, Babs, and and Stephanie Brown herself. Um, She had a supervillain father, just like Stephanie. She had paralysis and was bound to a wheelchair, just like Barbara. Um, And never really came across like as much of an original personality for me came across as is quite stagnant and it was probably if i had to pick one storyline and story element that was my least favorite i would go with wendy you know i can agree with that to a certain extent wendy never quite clicked on the flip side though i was incredibly happy to see her at the time um this is where continuity kind of comes in and bites you in the rear so to speak but wendy and her brother uh, were actually characters for a hot second in uh, teen titans And they had this dog that they adopted and called Wonder Dog. And it's one of those moments that stood out to me on that run of Teen Titans where things just kept getting weirdly and incredibly violent. And this dog turned out to actually be a plant by a villain. And he grows into this huge beast and basically tries to eat both of them. Didn't you reference that in a previous episode? I remember that. Yes, I did. And so at the time, the assumption was that both the characters were dead, I believe. And so seeing Wendy pop up as a survivor, initially at least, I was very thrilled with that. Although I don't think she ever quite found her place in the story as a unique voice. She was felt ultimately, like you said, a little derivative of the the two leads of Oracle and, and Stephanie Brown. What surprised you most about this run, Chris? Probably, and this, um, and, uh, and, and aside from maybe 12 or 13 issues of a Green Arrow comic that I read at your recommendation a few years ago, every single comic book that I've read was at Marvel or like IDW maybe, like a, or, or like another publisher. So I had read next to nothing in DC. What really surprised me was how comfortable I felt. Like, I was, like, nervous. I was like, you know, this is DC. This is a whole different universe. What is this going to be like? But what really surprised me was just how universal comic book writing can be. And I felt like this was a story that I've read before. Like like I said, it felt like an ultimate Spider-Man comic. Like, I, I felt like there were similar comic, comic book, or excuse me, character elements. Like, I felt like some of the same emotions in reading this. Um, it's also interesting, this is one of the first times that I've read a quote-unquote minor character book. I usually go for, like, X-Men comics or Spider-Man or the Avengers comics or Fantastic Four. Pretty big, you know, A-list type name. So this is the first time I've seen a ma- minor character. So it was an interesting switch up in my reading habits to see a minor character like Stephanie operate in, like, a larger universe and seeing just a different point of view and perspective. Yeah, you know, I actually historically have a horrible tendency to identify in my comic books with the sidekicks and minor characters more than with the main (laughs) heroes, which is why for a while I was reading more Robin comic books and I was reading Batman comic books. So uh, I totally understand where you're coming from. I think there's a real value in exploring some of those minor characters, and I wish that uh, they would do that more in the TV and film division as well. I think there there are things there that could be mined wonderfully for really, really strong entertainment. Now, Chris, what kind of continuity or larger universe issues did you encounter? Was there anything you felt disconnected with because you weren't familiar with the continuity? Uh, just one little thing. Bruce Wayne was dead. Um, <laughs> I didn't know, uh, yeah, Bruce Wayne was dead. So I saw Batman. I just was like, oh, hey, Bruce, what's up, man? No. And then they called him Dick. And I was like, wait a minute. Is that a nickname or wait, Dick Grayson? What? Why is he Batman? So that was just a t- eensy teensy bit thing. Um, also, I didn't know any of the villains that were in this book hardly, um, including Stephanie's father. Um, but I found that it didn't keep me from enjoying the story. Um, I'm notorious. I'm I'm kind of OCD when it comes to things like this, even in my own reading habits, like, you know, X-Men continuity, which we'll get to in just a minute, um, can be quite strenuous. So I usually have another tab open for Google, like, who's this guy? Look up their Wikipedia page. Okay, what are their powers? What was their first issue? I'm just kind of OCD like that. Um... I am. I was a little bit bothered by the impending reboot. Um, I knew that it was coming. 
based on our interview with Brian. Um, so that kind of colored my feelings a little bit and, you know, kind of torqued me off a little bit. Um, and I'm, I'm just, that's a completely new concept with me as a mostly Marvel reader. So that's, you know, I have a question for you. How do you deal with that as a regular DC reader that they reboot seemingly every couple of years? How does that experience affect you? It, it's really funny, actually, because that is a. I, I always feel like that's kind of a misconception about DC Comics. Full on reboots uh, have happened, but they're actually fairly rare. There's really only two I can think of, and that's after Crisis of Infinite Earths in the 80s and then the new 52 reboot. Everything else is more like uh, cosmic events and continuity tweaks, but far ranging like all this stuff never happened and we're going to start from scratch has really only happened twice. Um, and I've not been a huge uh, pre-Crisis on Infinite Earths reader. So my continuity, the one that I grew up reading and enjoyed the most, was post-Crisis, uh, leading up to then the, the new 52. And I will freely admit, I, I did not deal well with that reboot. Uh, the new 52 turned me off big time uh, off of DC Comics for a while. And Rebirth, which was not a reboot, but really saying we're going to reintroduce some of the old continuity back into our books, uh, is really what brought me back into reading much, many more DC comic books than I was during the new 52. Reboots are tough. It's, I think, much easier sometimes for writers to say, you know, I'm going to use certain parts of the continuity and not use other parts rather than trying to wipe the slate completely clean. Because ultimately, you're going to wipe something away that is really important to some reader. It's going to alter a character in, in an essential way. And your property is going to lose fans because of that. So, yeah, I was not a big fan of the new 52. Now, Chris, final question. How do you think reading this text, Batgirl, Stephanie Brown, will change your reading choices going forward? Um, I've definitely been roped in to reading um, some more DC content. Um, I did really identify with some of the central elements and the central themes with this book. But I must admit that the bigger reason that I feel this way was because I read Superman Birthright for our previous episode. Um I need more hope right now, and I think we all do. And and reading those issues, I still have to go finish 7 through 12, but the, even just those first six issues that I read in preparation for our last episode like filled me with so much joy and hopefulness and like everything that I love about superheroes and everything that I go to comic books looking for, for comfort, for escapism, for a light in the darkness you know i found in in those first six issues of that book yeah i can totally see that and i can tell you that if we do another episode like that i've already had i already have another book picked out for you just based on the fact that you enjoyed bad girl stephanie brown i have another minor character for you another about 24 25 issue run that i think you would really enjoy um <laughs> but i'm i'm not going to drop that particular spoiler at this point all right, that wraps up my book report, if you will, on Batgirl Stephanie Brown by Brian Q. Miller and various artists, uh, including Lee Garbett, Dustin Wynn, and Perry Perez. Um, Dave's assignment that I gave to him was Astonishing X-Men Volume 1, written by Josh, uh, excuse me, Joss Whedon, and uh, art by John Cassidy. Um, so that's what he went with. I, I think that included issues one through 24 and then the giant size special, uh, if memory serves. Um, and we're headed to break world, ladies and gents. Um, so Dave, what did you like most about what you read? Before I say anything, I think I need to preface this by just saying that I'm not a long-term time X-Men reader. I know just a bit about the property and characters from watching the 90s animated series as a kid. And I've watched some of the Fox movies, uh, which, you know, some of them quite good, others not so much. So my my view of the property is probably skewed a little bit because of that. But this is undeniably a, a really good run. Cassidy's art is fantastic on this book. And uh, Whedon's dialogue is snappy as always. I always have felt that uh, his ear for dialogue is by far his best trait as a writer. I also really enjoyed most of the characters he decided to focus on, with one pretty big exception, but we'll get to that. I learned later that Morrison 
in his previous run, the one leading up to this Astonishing X-Men run, uh, that Morrison had basically decided to um, sort of not focus on the superhero trapping so much. And then Whedon came in and decided to lean into that, to kind of swerve the book back towards superheroes. And obviously both approaches are valid. And I've started reading Morrison's run since I finished this one. Um, and it's good too. I mean, both approaches work. But what Whedon does in this one, if you like superheroes, is is very, very good. I also really enjoyed that he tried to do some new stuff with villains. Uh, most of the villains featured in this run, I think, were brand new based on my research. I thought that was a really good call. He doesn't retread. He tries to push forward. But my number one most favorite thing about this book, and I've texted you this already, was by far Kitty Pride. Yes! She's just awesome in this book. You can really tell that Whedon has an affinity for the character, was a previous fan of the character. I think he said in an interview at one point that she actually served as one of the inspirations behind Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I see that totally. She's very much the focus of the book, the entry point for readers. She's the character who's been gone for a while and comes back to the X-Men. And so she's perfect in that role. I had a lot of fun with this. Yeah, first and foremost, John Cassidy's art is probably my favorite X-Men art. If I had to pick just off the cuff without, you know, a lot of prep for time. I love how realistic it is, how like it, it's just like, it feels like it's happening right next to you. Um, Kitty Pride is the main reason that I suggested this one. Um, or assigned it, whatever, what you will, uh, what have you. Um, Kitty Pride is just a fantastic character and does not get enough clout. Um, if you were primarily, if you're, if going by what you said, if your only exposure were the X Men cartoons, which I don't think she's even in those, um, and the X Men movies, then you definitely don't know just how awesome that Kitty Pride is. Um, she's one of the best parts about Claremont's run. There's no way that I could have assigned you Claremont's run um, and been anywhere comparable to the 24 issues of Stephanie Brown. Um, but, you know, if I could have, I would have. But she, throughout all of Claremont's run, um, Kitty Pride at her best serves as like a go between for the audience. Um, almost like almost breaking the fourth wall. Like there's that iconic cover where she points like out to the audience and she says professor xavier is a jerk and like she's wearing that winter jacket and like it's just uh, and this is like a constant thing we've kicked around with with young superheroes with luciano vecchio you know with with brian q miller and, and previous guests is like they're just filled with that spunk and that optimism and they really don't care and we see this a lot as educators of young people they will tell you like it is whether you want to hear it or not, um, a lot of the times it takes like a young voice like that to bring into question. You get you get so caught up in the schematics and the semantics of everything. You know, you have Cyclops and Emma Frost trying to run this whole operation. And, you know, even though she's in her early 20s, I believe, in this continuity, in this time period, she's still like, no, 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 no. I'm your accountability. I'm your conscious, uh, conscience. And, and, and I just love the elements that she brings. Um, in this story and just about every piece that she's featured in. But Dave, I, I think you had a frosty reception, if you'll forgive my pun, um, of another character. So what do you think could have been better? Well, I, I'll start mild and say that I didn't think the Danger Room becoming an AI villain quite clicked for me. I think it was fine. Uh, the idea is quite good. The execution was just... It was very hard to, to nail this particular villain down uh, as to motivation. or And, and like the, through, even throughout the run, that villain just keeps swerving all over the place as far as like alliance and allegiance. So it was, it was very um, meh for me in that regard. I didn't really like danger as a villain. The thing that also didn't click for me is, yes, you are right, Emma Frost... That character just doesn't work for me. I know what Whedon was going for, exploring, you know, a former villain and whether she's truly heroic or she has some kind of hidden agenda. The problem is, I think, that it never really paid off in a big way. You know, when when we're finally at the point in the story where it's like, okay, 
you know, Emma is not the bad guy. There is never this big heroic moment where she just puts her foot down and says, I'm the good guy. Instead, what we get is this really quiet, understated moment where she basically admits to Cyclops that she loves him. And that's it. And I really felt like we needed something bigger to silence the naysayers, including myself. We never got that. My biggest problem by far, though, with this book is the ending. So you have Joss Whedon write this fantastic character, Kitty Pride, and he gives her this great big heroic moment at the end on a space bullet. And then she ends up stuck there as the book ends. Joss Whedon leaves, and Kitty Pride is stuck on this space bullet for the next six years of real time. I tried to pick up with the character because I enjoyed her so much, and I couldn't really find a good place to pick up reading more about Kitty Pride. And so, okay, you want to remove Kitty Pride from the equation, you know, at the very least, you can then take uh, the guy she's in love with, Colossus, and you have really good storyline potential there. You know, he's mourning because Kitty is out there, or he goes on a quest trying to find her and bring her back or something. But no, uh, Warren Ellis, I believe, took over the book after Joss Whedon, and he just was like, eh, don't want to write Colossus, so he's just gone now. So, we have this big dramatic moment, but it never opens any doors to future stories. And as such, that's really not a good way to end the book. You, if you're going to make a, uh, an ending like that, that's kind of cliffhangery, it should lead to some kind of story potential. And it never did. And so the, the ending did not resonate with me at all. I was quite disappointed with it. Yeah, so just to preface this, I'm I'm currently in the middle of an X-Men read-through. I, I've referenced this uh, in in the past episodes before. And so when I got to the Warren Ellis era of Astonishing X-Men, I almost like quit reading the title for that exact reason. Like you you left with such a climactic thing and then you just completely jerked. And I almost had like a, like, uh, you know, my head was spinning because, you know, you jerked and like I had like, you know, vertigo because we went in a completely different direction. There was a, a completely new arc that came out of nowhere you know, it was over. And I'm currently, like, in the latter parts of 2011 in main uh, continuity with my read-through. And j- I just finished a comic last night in, in Uncanny, the main title, Uncanny X-Men, where you get some kind of resolution with Breakworld and and Kern and all of this and, and, and Colossus and follows up. Um, and about, I want to say about 15, 20 issues ago. And it, again, it happens in uncanny X-Men. You have Magneto come to utopia where um, Scott and Emma have gone off the coast. I believe it's even on the Island of Alcatraz, but it's off the coast of the Bay area in California. And they've set up this mutant utopia because um the the mansion in, in New York keeps getting destroyed or whatever. So like we're going to go to a new place. We're going to create this mutant utopia. All mutants are welcome. Um, and then Magneto comes and wants to join the team. And they're like, dude, you've been our biggest villain forever. So in order to like prove himself, he sits and meditates like on this mountaintop for like 24 hours. And then all of a sudden, here comes Kitty Pride in that bullet. But this was like six or seven years later in real life time. Like I want to say that astonishing ended in 2004. Um, and then I, uh, I think Magneto bringing her back from light years away in a magnetic bullet, uh, was around 2010, 2009 at the earliest by Matt fraction, um, and company. And then when she comes back, she still cannot like solidify. So she is in constant phase mode. So she can't really do anything. And it's such a disservice to this character, like who is like one of my personal favorites. And, you know, you and I are not in the minority of loving Kitty Pride. Like she's a really popular character. And that was one of the major reasons that people had problems with the Fox depictions because she was so underused in those films you know so for her to just be here doing next to nothing you know after years of being gone it's just been really frustrating um but when kieran gillen just took over where i'm at 
um, in the uncanny read through. And, and when, when Kern comes from break world and they have some resolution, she finally gets some, some, some powerful moments and I'm, I'm happy. Hopefully she, she still is intangible and she still cannot phase. She has like this buzz light year, um, thing on her head, uh, this fishbowl. She looks like Mysterio, but whatever, hopefully she can, you know, solidify soon. But um, it, it's just really such a disservice to a great character. Um, I totally agree with that. I, I, it's just really frustrating. So, you know, there's my venting on your book report. I apologize. But um, what surprised you the most about reading Astonishing? Uh, so Cyclops actually did. That character is somehow the redheaded stepchild of the X-Men. Yeah, he's the team leader and all, but he always seems to be portrayed kind of as this this aloof, distant jerk in a lot of ways. And very few people seem to actually really love Cyclops. And I think Whedon did a very good job here giving him a really cool arc. So he's now the headmaster of the school. He's taking Professor X's position, basically. He's very insecure at the beginning of the book. You know, he he at one point says, Professor X would have known what to do now. Like, he's very unsure of himself. He's dealing with a lot of stuff. And then he grows. He grows from insecure and doubtful to a really good leader. I really like that moment that towards the end of the run when he basically is putting this plan in motion and he turns the tables on, on the bad guys and he, he does the famous Professor X line, you know, to me, my X-Men. And it was fantastic. It was big. It was epic. And I've never really, in, in any of the pictures that I've seen before of that character, have I ever felt like that about him. And so I was... It was nice to have positive feelings towards a character that I really haven't enjoyed in the past. Now, I will say his relationship with Emma Frost felt icky in a lot of ways somehow. Um, there's a really weird moment at the beginning of the run where Wolverine and Cyclops are fighting uh, about Jean Grey's death. And she says something to the, along the lines of she ha she doesn't understand why she's being ignored for a corpse when she has the, the best body money can buy. So that whole relationship just felt really odd and icky to me. But everything else about Cyclops in this run was really good. Yeah, um, and I forgot to comment this on the last part. I was so angered by the treatment of Kitty Pride. But um, yeah, Emma Frost, for me, uh, is a lifelong X-Men and mutant fan. I, I just don't get it. I don't get the love for this character. And, you know, this may... You know, not, this may set off a bomb. This is my hot take of the week. I'm not an Emma Frost fan. Like, I don't get it. To your point, she never clearly makes a statement that she is a good guy. Like, she's always plays this duality, which can be fun and flirty and whatever. But I feel like, honestly, like, the reason that she's so popular is because she is a walking Victoria's Secret ad. Like, she doesn't wear, you know, full clothing 90% of the time. And so, for me, the reason that, that I did not give you um, Grant Morrison's uh, new X-Men as an assignment is because that's where the whole Scott and Emma affair of the mind started and, like, took place. And I was still so pissed off by that. Like, I, I was like, well, I'm not going to burden him with that because I'm still angry about it. And I read it so long ago. Um, and just as a Jean Grey fan, like... It has always colored my depiction of Cyclops because he just doesn't get it. Like, Jean Grey is like one of the most powerful mutants in the world, if not the most powerful mutant in existence. One of the most powerful individuals in the Marvel Universe. In fact, they had like this battle royale this past summer and she like came out on top. Like, she was the most powerful person in the Marvel Universe. And, like, she is smitten as a kitten with him, and he's just like, oh, I think she died. So he goes off and marries Madeline Pryor because she he thinks she kind of looks like Jean. And then it turns out, oh, my God, she's actually a clone of Jean. No wonder she looks like her. So then, like, he goes, and as soon as Jean, quote-unquote, comes back to life in the pages of X Factor, he ditches Madeline and a child to go run off and be with Jean. And then... You know, he's married to Jean or whatever um, after Maddie becomes the Goblin Queen and the whole Inferno event happens. But that's another episode. Um, so then he's with Jean for a while. And then Emma comes along and he's so like despondent in his marriage. And he goes and 
visits Auntie Emma, which is super creepy. Um, and they have like these therapy sessions of the mind. And then Jean, being a telepath herself, walks in on it. And then there's no real resolution. And then shortly thereafter, Jean is killed. And nobody really apologizes for anything. So I need some justice for Jean Grey. And that happened in like 2002 or three. And I'm now in my read through in like 2011 and nobody gives a crap. Like, no, oh, yeah, just they're together. So, uh, yeah, Emma Frost is lame. And to your point about Cyclops, it was at this point that I finally started to buy into Cyclops because I had had so many years of pent up angst towards him. Because he not only did he come across as like the Leonardo of the X Men, the insufferable leader, do goody turd, um, then he was making decisions like this and just being such a turd when it came to the women in his life. But it was at this moment, and if you want some good Cyclops, go read Matt Fraction in Uncanny writing Cyclops. Some of the best stuff that you'll see. So, so the way Matt Fraction and now Kieran Gillen, I'm totally loving what they're doing with the character. He's finally got some backbone and he's kind of morphing into what Cyclops is in current comics and like, you know, being a really strong leader and stop being this whiny do-gooder, Dudley Do-Right crossed with this, you know, adulterer. So, yeah. So um, what continuity uh, or larger universe issues did you encounter, Dave? Yeah, so in this regard, I will say, Chris, that your homework assignment was not friendly to me. <laughs> the continuity stuff was really tough. So it seems like Whedon picked up on some story threads from Grant Morrison's run in New X-Men. And I had not read that beforehand. And so I was really lost in some aspects. So Professor X is in exile. I have no idea why. Um, he shows up at one point in the book and then disappears again. I don't know why. Jean Grey is dead, but it's not her phoenix death. Apparently she came back from that and then died again. No idea what's going on there. How often has she died and come back at this point? I'm really starting to wonder. And then there's the Cassandra Nova character. And her mind is like trapped in this slug looking thing. And I was like, what? What? So that I have now started reading uh, Morrison's new X-Men and this, some of this stuff is starting to make a little bit more sense. Um, although I'm not that far into Morrison's run to make sense of what happened to Professor X yet. Uh, in short, though, most of the stuff going on in the book was pretty new reader friendly. Uh, I think Whedon did a good job trying to make it accessible. Uh, I think there could have been a couple of places where there was a little bit more explanation given uh, just because there was a lot assumed that there were long-time readers reading. And I can imagine a lot of readers came to this book specifically thinking, oh, Joss Whedon is writing X-Men, I want to really, I want to really read this. Um, it's definitely more accessible than what's going on right now in X-Men. Because I did get interested in reading more, and I tried to read the whole House of X, Power of X thing, and I was completely and hopelessly lost, and I think I'm going to have to build up a little bit more of my my continuity backbone before I can jump into modern X-Men. Um, but this I could make sense of, even if there were a couple of things, uh, particularly the Cassandra Nova slug, uh, what in the world, uh, that I really had trouble making sense of. Yeah, that very first arc um, of New X-Men, I, I, I was really close to picking that one. It was between those two. Um, that really, the, those first three issues of Morrison's New X-Men, the E is for Extinction, are just fantastic, like, really powerful stuff with Cassandra Nova. But, um, yeah, I think, I think probably part of it, too, I'm just sitting here thinking, when you have a book like Batgirl Stephanie Brown, you have one character. So, like, if you're jumping in at that part, um, at that point in her history, you were like, okay, I have to worry about this one character and the connected universe, you know, like, hmm. But when you have a team book like X-Men, you have that many more plot points that are like, oh, they did this in this book and they did this book. And then, you know, the sheer volume and the sheer number of X titles, um, you know, even with my read through, um, I've picked up, you know, at, at some points I've been reading four titles at any given year in continuity. Um, at some points I just have to like tell myself, no, you can't handle another title. You can't do X-Force right now, uh, you know, just for time's sake. But yeah, so, um, so that makes a lot of sense. But 
So you've kind of already hinted at this, but how do you think um, reading this text is going to change your reading choices going forward? Well, I really want to read more X-Men now. Uh, I will freely admit that this was a really good run. I've already went ahead and picked up um, New X-Men by Grant Morrison. I'm really, really enjoying uh, Frank Quietly's art on that. Um, oh, I love it so much. Oh, yeah, it's so wonderful. His 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 art, my first real brush with his art, I think, was All-Star Superman which was incredible, uh, and, and another uh, collaboration with Morrison. And so seeing him pop up as the artist of New X-Men, going back to that, I was just thrilled. Now, he does uh, rotate off of the book occasionally, but every time that he is on the book, it's just it's a visual feast. Um, I definitely would like to know uh, which X-Men stories featuring Kitty Pride are good, because that character resonated with me the most. Um, and I was still, after... 24 issues and a giant special. I'm not a fan of Emma Frost, and I don't think that's going to change at any point. So I'm probably going to try to avoid that character as much as humanly possible. <laughs> you know, it's it's funny because that tough, cold, snarky demeanor, I really thought it would draw me in, especially because one of my all-time favorite characters acts kind of like that, and that's Damian Wayne Robin on the DC side. But with Emma, it just does not work, so... But other than that, I'm really enjoying uh, that new X-Men run now for Morrison. I think there's a lot of good stories I still can get into. I think eventually I'm going to want to read some Claremont for sure. I hear only good things about that particular run on X-Men. Um, but yeah, it, it was a really positive experience for me overall. Yeah, I think the problem with me for Emma Frost is she embodies so many things that I don't particularly value. Like materialism and then like, I feel like she's a... a like a, a rejected real housewife of Beverly Hills or something like, you know, plastic surgery and, you know, dressing immodestly. It just doesn't vibe for me. And it's not what I look for in my, my favorite characters. When I think of like my favorite, you know, female characters in comics, I think of Mary Jane who can be, you know, sexy and, and, you know, be a model and do all of those things, but she has a personality that is unique. Um, and when you were explaining Lois Lane to me, um, on, a, on one of our previous episodes, I think it was last episode, um, I was like, he's describing Mary Jane right now. So, like, um, so I could definitely get that, you know, especially like Ultimate um, MJ, where she's like the reporter for the school newspaper and like she's so, you know, tenacious. Like, I, I love that. Um, I, you know, I love Kitty Pride because she is in, in a similar, you know, f fashion. She is tenacious and she's not going to give up and she doesn't give a crap if, you know, Emma thinks she's the bee's knees. My favorite panel um, from this and language content warning and Dave can bleep me out. But my favorite one is when um, Emma is like down in this bottomless pit and Kitty phases all the way down through the Earth's crust to go save her. And she says... And I quote, cry me a river, we're going up. Like, just moments like that from Kitty Pride. like, I just, I'll take that any day of the week. So if you're looking for good Kitty Pride issues, definitely the Claremont run. She comes in, like, the early 100s, I want to say, like, the 120s. Um, but what I did, personally, is I took Giant, X, uh, Giant Size X-Men number one in 1975 by Len Wein and Dave Cockrum. Um, and then Claremont took over Uncanny whatever that next issue of uncanny was i think it was 95 i want to say 95 the number 95 is sticking in my brain and then you just keep going until like the early 90s when they relaunch um the new x-men title volume two but yeah um yeah emma i i will i i can't do it with emma like she's just there's nothing there there's no substance to her character it's all surface value stuff for me I think one of the things we've discovered from these uh, homework assignments is that our tastes in characters actually run quite parallel, even though we prefer different comic book companies' output right now. So I think I feel really comfortable taking on future homework assignments from you, Chris. I think uh, I think the kind of things we like are are vibing very well. 
Yeah, absolutely. Now, we'll say also in the 80s, she also joined the Excalibur. So if you're looking for X, for, for Kitty Pride and another one of my favorite mutants, Kurt Wagner, Nightcrawler, they both went to England and they were part of the Excalibur book, which I have not read yet. But I, after I'm done with all of my X-Men stuff up to, to present, I'm going to go back and read Excalibur. Now, that sounds awesome. All right, folks, that was our big uh, book report, so to speak, on our homework assignments on Batgirl Stephanie Brown and Astonishing X-Men. After our break, we're going to be right back with some nerd commendations. Stick around. And we're back. It's time to wrap up another episode of the Nerd By Word podcast with our patented Nerd commendations. Chris, what are you nerd commending this week? I'm nerd commending a video game by the name of Tom Clancy's The Division 2. Now, this is a sequel to The Division, um, but I never played The Division, the first game. Um, it's a video game that's made by Ubisoft, and I really enjoy the club rewards for the Ubisoft club. You get like free gear um, and outfits and everything. That's super cool. The weaponry. Um, so the basic premise for this game is that an, uh, a chemical agent was released and now every major city in the United States is basically like a war zone and there's safe houses and it's basically like a radioactive apocalypse. And then you have like this kind of paramilitary group called the Division um, that tries to kind of restore order and like um, take care of, you know, individuals who are without food or shelter or water. Um, and then you have like these warring factions of like basically gangs that have risen up in in light of this, like the hyenas, um, the True Sons, um, and and other other gangs like this. You have to go face off against. And I'm not typically like a military style gamer and like a a shooter, but this one hooked me with the smooth style of play, um, the incredible storytelling. It's like a really great campaign like it's fantastically written and with a name like uh, tom clancy attached that's not a real surprise um and then you also have these really fun and awesome customer uh excuse me character customizations like my character has a beard and long hair and a ponytail um he's got a ball cap he's got cool shades he's got war paint on his face and but then he's wearing jeans and a flannel shirt um and then you can like customize your backpack and then you also get like these cool tech thing so if you're a techie guy um and you like tech combat this is for you like i have these really cool seeker grenades and like i throw out these seeker grenades and then they go automatically go find my enemies and take them out i also have this like drone that like automatically goes and snipes people out that's pretty cool so if i'm like going and trying to like stealth take people out that's awesome and i also like it because it's not your typical like i'm gonna snipe you game um, like so many games are, but there is that feature if you want to do that. But initially, I actually bought this game on sale in the Microsoft Digital Store. It was like 90% reduced to $5.99. So then I, I looked over at my son and I was like, dude, this is $5.99. If this is the worst game ever, we lost... We lost, you know, like a Big Mac meal for this game, you know? And then we'll just delete it off our hard drive. But I bought it just kind of because it was $5.99. And then I played it all throughout the first few months of quarantine. Like, it's all that I did in my free time. Um, And it's also one of the few games that I can sit and play for hours. Like, usually, I'll go play a mission on Red Dead Redemption 2. Or I'll play a, a game of a sports game. And then I'll be done. Like, an hour tops. This one... My wife was like, are you, are you okay? Have you eaten today? It's one of those games. Like, it's just really enjoyable. Um, uh, I also like the interesting premise. It might be a little bit too real for some of some people right now that we have, like, this toxic viral thing that's going around the globe and we're basically, like, kind of shut in right now. So maybe if, if, that's, if that's striking too true for you, maybe kind of avoid it. But um, like I said, I never played the first game, and it's not exactly necessary um, you get it. Like this chemical agent was released and now we're in this post-apocalyptic thing. I get it. I don't need the whole first one, but I did buy the first one when it was on sale and I look forward to playing it soon. Um, I, I made a list of pros and cons. The things that I really love about the game is that you can hide behind barriers and shoot from behind cover. So if like somebody is like trying to shoot at you, you just go behind like this big concrete barrier and then you can like aim without coming out of cover and take somebody out and you don't get shot. 
Um, and then you also have this really cool feature where while you're behind cover, you just keep holding the A button. And like, let's say I have a destination in front of me. I will like progress towards that destination while remaining in cover if I hold the A button. So it's not like this thing where I have to get out of cover, run, hit the hit the button to go back in cover. It's this smooth transition to where I can stay undercover the whole time because there will be like cars and then like a concrete barrier and then like a lamppost that I can hide behind for cover. So it's a really a smooth gameplay. It's really cool. Um, the character customizations are super fun. Like I said, the storyline is top notch. It does have a quick uh, quick link up for co-op missions. That is nice if there's like a co-op mission or if you like have a tough mission that you need some help on. It is it is a game that is constantly live and online, so that has pros and cons. Pro is that if you need help on a mission, you can go, you know, have a faction, have somebody join you real quick, and boom, they, they help you out. The the one, and this is a big one, the one con that I have about this game is you can't pause it. There is no pause button. Um, because of that constant online feature. So your best bet is to try and hide somewhere or go stay in a safe house. That is like the one place you can be. Like if you have to go to the bathroom or in my case, if you're potty training a toddler, um, oh God, guess I'm going to die. You're just going to have to resign yourself that you're just going to die. So just put the controller down. But that's the one big thing that I did have with it. Um, Also, a little minor one is your character doesn't talk. It's kind of like Fable or Red Dead Online, you have that silent protagonist where everybody's talking to you in the mission. It's just kind of awkward that you're just like nodding the whole time. You never talk. So this actually sounds like something I might like because uh, it has some really good ingredients for me. I love a good open world game. I love the post-apocalyptic setting generally. It really works well for me. Uh, I enjoy customizing characters. I love managing equipment. I guess my biggest concern uh, is A... Military shooters very rarely resonate with me. I've tried several Call of Duty games. I've tried several Battlefield games. Uh, really, I've tried several of either series, and it never quite clicked for me. But probably the much bigger concern is that online multiplayer component. Is is it possible to play this game, Chris, without really having to engage with people? Can you just kind of go solo at it if you want to do that? Oh, absolutely. And I totally echo, like you said, with the militaristic son. I... I... This is a hot take. I hate all those other games. Um, so I was really surprised that I enjoyed this this much. Um, but yeah, th- so like the only feature that you will notice is that other people are just running around. They can't shoot you or anything. So like you can go about your business. So there's no like I'm going to get sniped while going to the butcher like I had in Red Dead. Um you just do your thing like and and they're there. So like you could just hit the button if you want to link up with them. But if you don't want to, I, I never join up. I just, you know, I listed that as like, if that's your thing, go ahead. But like for me, I have constantly played on my own. I've never joined up with anybody. Well, that gives me hope that I might go ahead and check that out. Because most of the time when I've joined online communities trying to play, you know, these multiplayer games, it, it I usually end up in some groups with some rather toxic individuals and the fun goes out of the window very quickly then. Absolutely. Now, Dave, you hinted at your nerd commendation for this week uh, earlier in the pod. What do you have for us? I'm just going to go ahead and recommend the entire output of a company. I love old-time radio. I have a particular fondness for pre-television radio dramas. For a while, I was borderline obsessed with listening to radio episodes of The Shadow from the 30s and 40s and 50s, or the original Gunsmoke radio show before it was turned into a television series. So when my fandom of Doctor Who uh, led me to stumble over Big Finish Productions, I was thrilled. Big Finish is a production company, publisher, and distributor. They produce CDs, downloads, and books, and are best known for the range of Doctor Who full-cast audio dramas. The writing is sharp as a knife. The production values are fantastic. More importantly, though, is that Big Finish works directly with actors who have been involved with the Doctor Who television series. Actors who have played past incarnations of the Doctor continue to play the character in brand new sort of lost stories. Most recently, David Tennant returned to the role for a series of audio specials. So you can actually get more David Tennant Doctor Who in audio form in full cast audio dramas from Big Finish Productions. 
Uh, they also bring in various supporting characters for spin-offs and the like. It's through these audio stories that I discovered the Eighth Doctor, played by Paul McGann. He really became one of my favorites. He only ever got to play the character in one live-action movie, a failed revival of the show. And since then, he's acted in countless audio dramas, and they're all just simply fantastic. He's actually one of my favorite actors to play the role. The company's more than just Doctor Who, of course. They have produced stories for BBC's Avengers, for Torchwood, for classics like Sherlock Holmes. I think they recently did a Dracula production. Uh, in an era where podcasts and audio entertainment are becoming more popular once again, I really can't recommend Big Finish enough. Uh, I recommend it with all my heart if you're at all interested in full cast audio productions, or if you've never even tried them and are just a little curious, Big Finish's output is really the gold standard of the industry today. Yeah, that's definitely intriguing, and 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 once I get back or once I get into the Doctor Who stuff, definitely I'll be checking that out. But also, you said Sherlock Holmes, and that's music to my ears. So I I, I love being able to put on an audio book or an audio program, or that's how I got into like listening to podcasts years ago. Was I needed something to do when I was mowing the lawn, or I needed something to do when I was driving to work, or washing dishes, or you know anything. And, and it's one of my favorite things that I continue to go back to. Um, so I'm definitely going to have to check this one out. I love pretty much anything the BBC puts out. Uh, Brits, Brits always seem to do great stuff when it comes to entertainment. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I don't think you'd be disappointed at all with Big Finish. Their output has been uh, you know, very much uh, a staple in my audio rotation. Alrighty, folks, that is it for another episode of the Nerd by Word podcast. Thank you so much for joining us this week. If you uh, enjoyed what you listened to, please make sure to give us a, a five-star review on any podcasting platform. Uh, we would totally appreciate that. Please make sure to check in with us again next week uh, as well. We'll have a new episode again on Monday with more nerdy content for you. And if you're on social media, be sure to check us out. We are on Instagram and Twitter, at NerdByWord, and uh, individually as at ThatNerdChris and at ThatNerdDave. Uh, you can also find our page on Facebook, at the Nerd by Word. Um We're also got some stuff in the works for future episodes, guys. We are not stagnant. We are constantly in planning mode. So we are currently in discussions with multiple uh, podcasts for a crossover event, uh, a crisis on infinite pods, if you will. So stick around for future news about that. That's super, super exciting. Um, some some great cats that we've been uh, you know, connected with on social media, and, and we look forward to bringing you those things. Um, but as always, we thank you for stopping by. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube for audio uh, versions of these episodes. Um, but as always, stay well and stay nerdy. The Nerd By Word is produced by two nerds, Chris and Dave, to encompass all aspects of the nerd multiverse. The theme music was written by Al Jimenez. Our show art features original art by Ashby Design, as well as public domain comic pens. Find us online at nerdbyword.com, on Twitter at nerdbyword, and send questions and comments to nerdbyword at gmail.com.